What's up everybody, this is Cakes and welcome back to another tutorial in which we add texture loading and sprite rendering to our game engine. To get STB image, just go to this website right here on the GitHub. I will put this link in the description. And then right here you can click on download raw file. After that locate the files in the downloads, then go into Celeste Clone, into third party and paste that right in here. I've already done that, but this is how you can get STB image. Now that we have STB image, this file right here we're going to add this to our glrenderer.cpp at the very top you have to include it like this you define the stb image implementation basically signaling that you want to not only have the headers and the defines you also want to have the actual implementation this define right here can only be in the entire program at once so make sure that this is the only one right here and then you include the stb image which should be fine like this since we are including third party right here so it should look in this folder to find it and then after that we head over to gl init and let's say right before we enable dev we create a new section and call that texture loading using stbi and for that we need a texture actually my program of choice is always a sprite i actually have a tutorial on how to build it yourself if you don't want to pay for it uh, to this date it still works the tutorial should still work so we're going to create a new file and this is going to have a size of 1024 by 1024 you can make it bigger if you want to, but this one should always be fine for now. And if you want to have a bigger texture in the future, you can just extend the texture without worrying about anything, because the renderer will handle the resize. It will just load in the size of the texture and then supply that to the GPU. Alright, and then I'm quickly going to save it already. Uh, let's find Celeste Clone. Assets. And then over here, we need to create a new folder. Hopefully that works and call that textures. Now then I want to call this, I guess texture atlas would be fine. And then if you press control E, it should export your file and we do an output file here as a PNG. And then it will put the output file into the same folder as your A sprite file. These are two different files. And then you just hit OK. So you have the PNG file there present as well. If we now switch back to our program, we should see an assets, a new folder textures with a, a sprite file, which the editor can't load, of course, and a PNG file that is empty. Okay, so this is the interface of STBI loading a texture. We need a file name, an int x, y, the number of channels, and then the number of channels required. And so we need to fill all of these in. So that means we create an int width, height, channels, like this. And then we fill these in. And then how many do we want? Well, of course, four. We want to have red, green, and blue, and alpha. And then the only thing left is the file name. And since I want to also do texture reloading, there's two ways you can do this. You can add a constant at the very top and say, well, this is the one texture that we're going to load. Or you can store the texture into the GL context. I think I want to create a constant right here, calling a GL OpenGL constants. And then we do a const char pointer texture path and then that is assets slash textures slash and then the texture atlas.png then we have this right here and we can jump down back into our local scope and then just supply the texture path and this function returns us a pointer to the data of the image so we want to create a character pointer data Okay, and apparently I forgot the pointer to the number of channels here. After we have loaded the data, we obviously want to check if we actually have data or not. And if we don't, we obviously want to do an SM assert, calling it fail to load texture, and then we return false. Okay, then we want to call GL generate textures. We want to generate one texture uh, if we don't have data. If we don't have data, make sure that you have that in here. And we call that or we store that in the texture ID of the GL context, which obviously we have not defined yet. So we're going to go to the GL context at the top and create another GLU and texture ID like this. And then obviously we want to supply the pointer to that because we are going to store it in this value right here. After we have generated the texture, we also need to activate it. 
and you can do it like this and the texture zero stands for the slot and it's best explained if i show you what that means in the shader so switch over to the shader in assets shaders and then the fragment shader in your shader you're going to have something like this layout location zero uniform sampler 2d texture atlas this location zero is an index and if you take a look at our renderer we use the texture zero and we can look into the define we have one two three four all the way up to I guess 31 and we are going to access or look for the texture with the index 0. After that we bind the texture to a 2D texture and using our texture ID that we generated earlier. Now it is actually connecting the slot 0 to our texture ID that we just created. Okay I copied these in because it is easier for me to explain them than to type them. This is where we set parameters on our texture. For example we want to set how the wrapping is done. And we are going to clamp to the edge at this point. This is for X and Y. And then down below here, we are going to set the magnifying and minifying filter to GL linear. Now you might be wondering why we use linear. If you have ever done something similar in Unity, for example, there's always nearest neighbor sampling for pixel art and then linear filtering for, let's say, 3D art. And the reason why we are using GL linear is because we're going to access the texture using the texel coordinates and these are actual coordinates in the texture which means that the filtering doesn't even have any effect and we can, and you can see that in the comment here as well this setting only matters when using the glsl texture function when you use texel fetch this setting has no effect because texel fetch is designed from the because texel fetch is designed for this purpose and you can look at the blog post over here glsl data tricks so basically what this means is since we're using texel fetch this doesn't even have any effect, but it's still interesting for the future and you will see then why. After that we call GL Texture Image 2D, we supply our texture ID, a level of 0, the color space of the texture which is sRGB, then the width and the height, a border of 0, the format the data is in which is RGBA, then the type of data which is an unsigned byte and then the data. If you're getting this error right here, the GL Invalidinum, that is because I supplied the texture ID here, but we don't have to do that because we are already binding the active texture right here, which means uh, the enum that we have to supply is that we are copying to a 2D texture. And this function is going to copy everything from the CPU to the GPU. Now, how exactly that works, I don't know. That is an internal to OpenGL. After that, we are now able to call STBI image free and that should release the data that we allocated. And this is everything that we need in order to load textures and we should now have our texture on the GPU. In fact, we can already access this texture if we know which coordinates to index into. For that, we define a layout location zero in vector two texture coordinates in. And then if we want to get the texture color from the texture atlas, we call the texel fetch function, which takes in the texture atlas, of course. And then we need to convert our texture coordinates in into an integer value because these are coordinates and the texture coordinates in are a vector to float, which means they are being interpolated between each point on the screen. And so we need to convert these into integer values and then we index into the first level of the texture because we are not using any MIP levels. And then after that we have the texture color and we can assign that to the fragment color and we should be good. Now obviously we also have to change the vertex shader so we switch over to this. Once in the vertex shader we define a layer to location 0 to be the out path of our vector 2 texture coordinates out. It is important that this is a vector 2 because we actually want to output this as a float so it is interpolated between each vertex. And for now I'm going to debug define a left, top, right and bottom, which is 0, 0 and then 16 by 16. So if we switch over to our texture atlas, I'm going to quickly yoink a texture. Like for example this dice right here. This one is positioned at 0, 0. It is positioned on 0, 0 and has a size of 16 by 16. And then we fill in the texture coordinates to be left top, left bottom, right top, right top, left bottom and right top uh, and right bottom again. These correspond to the top ones right here. Top left, bottom left, top right, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And then we write to the texture coordinates out using the texture coordinates on the GL vertex ID. Again, that is the same idea that we use with the vertices. We have done everything correctly. We should already see a texture, right? 
Fail to compile Vertex Shader. Uh, Vertex Shader on line 44. An unexpected semicolon. You're expecting a closing brace. Ah, okay. Of course. I made a mistake on the vertex shader instead of semicolons. Right. These are supposed to be commas. Sorry about that. Well, this is the first instance in which we can see that our error checking on the shader compilation is actually working, which is nice. Uh, if we don't have data. If we don't have data. Make sure that you have that in here. If you're getting this error right here, the GL invalidinum, that is because I supplied the texture ID here. But we don't have to do that because we are already binding the active texture right here. Which means... Uh, the enum that we have to supply is that we are copying to a 2D texture. And now we should see something like this. We have a cool looking or kind of stretched looking cube. And then if we resize the window, it should stretch with the window. Now we have textures in game and I want to quickly fix our fragment shader. If our texture color alpha is zero, then we discard. That should turn the black into nothing. And this is our cube. Very nice. Very poggies. Uh, is it actually the same color? If we take a look on the right, the dice is not actually the exact same color as in the picture. And there's a way to fix this. We need to tell OpenGL something uh, that our target frame buffer is in a certain color space. And the way we do that is by enabling the frame buffer to be sRGB, which is the same color space as our texture. And then we also disable multi-sampling. If you want to go uh, and take a look, the sRGB output, even if the input texture is non-sRGB, don't rely on the texture used. And so basically when we do this and then build, the dice in the game should look exactly like the dice in the texture. And that is very important because what happens is our texture is in sRGB color space. And the, since the human eye needs to correct color because it is not able to perceive color linearly. But in the shader, we want to work with the color in the linear space. And then as we output that to the screen, we have to convert it back to sRGB so that our eyes perceive the color correctly. And that is what is happening right here. If we don't tell the frame buffer that it is in sRGB space, then it will be darker. The result will be darker as you've seen before. Here's a side-by-side -side view of how it looks before and after. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. And in the next tutorial, we are going to add in hot code reloading. And so yeah, stay tuned for that. Until the next one, have a good one. Peace! Let's go! Cut